deeper than music radio. Behind every great song is a greater story. Deeper than music radio, behind every great song, there's an even greater story. I like to say what's up to everybody listening to us on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and also check us out now on the Nice Media Roku channel. Today we have a very special guest. Um, one of the one of the last memories, and we were just talking about one of the last memories before this pandemic. Um, me, my, my my partner uh, Gary Devon, and also my girlfriend, we went to the Sue Wong's Oscar Gala. Um, prior to that, I met this awesome guy, Jimmy Starr, Brian Russell, and also the special guest that we have right now. Uh, when we went to the Oscar Gala, I immediately saw Eileen, and she took care of us, and her personality. And just everything about this woman just speaks rock star. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have Queen rock star, celebrity journalist, and she published um, numerous books. Miss Eileen Shapiro here on Deeper Than Music. Eileen, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing as good as I can. You know, um, right now we're we're living a crazy history right now, and I'll be glad when this is all behind me. But um, before, like I said, before all of this went crazy, we were actually at Suwon's Oscar event, uh, Oscar Gala, and I just wanted to thank you, Ron, and uh, Jimmy. That was the first time I ever got to go to an Oscar Gala and interview so many celebrities. I was nervous as hell, but you guys couldn't tell. You were, never, you were great. You were yeah. great. You were yeah. everyone's favorite, for sure. Oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you. So you, I mean, um, you have the book Waiting for Adam, and like you've been in over 40 publications, um, book writer. Uh, I mean, you've known celebrities from Diane Ross, Whoopi Goldberg, Leanne Rimes, Brooke Shields. Like, how did this all start? Like, did you know that you wanted to be a, a journalist and just- Not at all. Not, not even close. What happened was I used to own a bar. It was a gay bar on Long Island. Oh, okay. Okay, and magazines would come in and ask, of course, you know, to be, to get an ad or what, whatever, to get an ad or to be, you know, put on the bar or whatever. So I started to write for one. I started to write for um, one called PM Magazine and then and then he, um, he stopped doing it like in the middle of it all. And then Get Out Magazine, Mike Todd from Get Out Magazine came with his magazine. Okay. And I was supposed to have some guests, some really cool guests from uh, from RuPaul's Drag Race. Okay. And instead of taking out an ad, I said, "Why don't you let me interview one?" And he said, "All right, go ahead. The rest is history." <laughs> I started to write for that magazine, and then I started to write for Huffington Post, and then I started to write for Louder Than War, and so forth and so forth. And now I write for about I don't know, fifty-seven of them. So, wow. And everyone in life wants to be in a gay magazine. They all want they all want to be recognized by the gay community because the gay community they're pretty loyal. So everyone wanted to be in that magazine, Diana Ross and, and Leanne Rhymes and Jennifer Hudson and just so many people. But in the meantime, in my own head, I wanted to I wanted an interview with Adam Ant, and I figured the more celebrities that I interviewed, the better chance I would get of interviewing Adam Ant. And that's really what I wanted. Yeah. So it, it took me six years, but I did it. Wow. So that's how it started. Adam Man is like a big celebrity, and I guess you had to like work your way down the hierarchy to. I did. Wow. I did. And, and um, one that I could just, you know, to keep in mind that. Eventually, one day, I'd be able to interview Adam, and and then like he was on my. I had three on my bucket list. Three. One was Rick Springfield, and he came to me for an interview. I I did an interview of Cindy Lauper, and he saw it and he was impressed. And his PR people, his team, came to me and said, "Can you interview Rick Springfield?" And I said, "Uh huh." And then the <laughs> next. The next one was Adam Ann. I, I finally, after six years, got him. And the next one, who I did not get yet, is Billy Idol. So if anyone listening knows Billy Idol, here I am. Oh, yeah, Billy Idol, big. I mean, well, even, yeah, Adam Ant, 
big '80s '80s guys like Billy. I, I imagine his 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 um, whole. I wonder if he's like he is in, in the videos, like you know. Ah. <laughs> I, I met him. I met him many times, and he is. He's totally like that, and he's he's really nice. And uh, I just never got an interview. Seen him, spoke to him, kissed him. Never got an interview. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And, and I, I imagine being in New York, you've seen a lot. Has, at any given time with like all these big names, Boy George, Diana Ross, Brooke Shields, have you ever had like a, a fangirl moment where you just like, oh, <laughs> yeah, I'm actually- I, uh, in I'm, a, I'm a fangirl. <laughs> Especially <laughs> with like Boy George, I was like, oh my God. Uh, yeah, I'm a fangirl. Anyone that I meet, um, I become a fangirl instantly. Just for a few minutes, then I get over it. Uh, but I, um, I, w I was a fan of Adams for like thirty years or whatever, you know, however long. So when yeah. I met him, I was really a fan girl. Like, so yeah, <laughs> yep. Even when I speak to them on the phone for the first five minutes, I'm a fan girl. But then you know what? They, everyone's just a person, and you kind of get over it. But yeah. it's still, you know, anyone I interview, it's still exciting. I, I don't care who it is it's still there's something you know they're people and they all have stories and they're they're all cool in their own ways and it's all you know it's exciting it's exciting to interview people yeah. anybody you, even if they're not super famous just anybody have you ever had um i know that you know they, they're celebrities some that you hear of that are very difficult have you ever had any like any because i mean you have so many publications you've interviewed so many celebrities have there ever been like a difficult like how am i going to get through this or <laughs> can you give me a break type of have you ever no i have never had that problem with celebrities i've had it with some indie artists but uh, one indie artist actually but i've never had a problem with the celebrity so, you know sometimes their answers weren't great i interview someone like Dionne warwick a couple of times and, and she's not big on the words so you have to really talk to her you know, some are harder than others. Some just never shut up and you don't know what to do. Uh, <laughs> hours, I couldn't get her off the phone, but she was great. I never, you know what, you're writing about them and they realize that. So they're usually kind of nice to you because you are the press. Yeah, and yeah. I've never, ever had a problem with, I, I've had problem getting interviews or, or, you know, setting up the interviews, but I've never had a problem interviewing any anyone. They've all been great. And that's interesting you say that because I remember um, before I we went to the Oscar gala, you know, they had the sheet and it was like so many celebrities. I'm like, how am I going to remember these people? And then um, how are we going to, you know, we were kind of at the end of the, the red carpet and I was like, nobody is going to come to us. And then next thing you know, we had a line waiting and I was like, oh, you my. had a line there. Yeah. You had a line there, but I set you up that way because I know that happens. They yeah. Get crowded on the main part of the red carpet, but as they leave, they still want that publicity and there you are. So it's perfect. No, that was, that was, that was uh, brilliant. And you, and um, you, it mentions that you've been to many continents. Your journey as being a journalist, what places have you been to that are like out of the norm? Or... Well, not, nothing out of the norm. I mean, I follow, well, the thing is I followed Adam to England, you know, oh. I, and then, France and stuff like that, and um, all over England, actually. <laughs> I know England really well, and um, Canada, that's another kind of continent. Is Canada a continent? Yes. <laughs> so I followed him to Canada. Um, I followed him pretty much all over the country, except L.A., and he was supposed to do a concert in L.A. before this mess. So I had tickets to go there, but now all everything, every concert in life is postponed till uh, 2021, which is so sad. Yeah, this is crazy. Um, so was this the waiting on Adam? Was this just the? Um, were you a, a mega fan of Adam? And this is something that like you've always wanted to. Prior to even being a journalist, wanted to meet Adam Ant. I was a mega fan, still am, of Adam since some. Mm -hmm. um, Oh my God, since before I had kids. So yeah, I used to uh, see him a lot when he came to to America. And uh -huh. then uh, and then all of a sudden he disappeared for 17 years. And then there he was again after 17 years. And I became, I renewed my fandom ship. 
<laughs> and you know, it's kind of like a dream, like it was surreal me. I met him before I interviewed him. I met him several times before I actually interviewed him, which was kind of cool also. But the when you interview someone, it's kind of intimate. Like yeah. you speak one on one. There's nobody there to ask a question or, or to like get in your way. And it, it's just like a one on one thing. So I wanted it I wanted to interview. I mean I met him I don't know, four or five times before I interviewed him. And then I met him after I interviewed him. And uh, it's just that interview that you can pretty much ask what you want. Yeah. And you want to make everyone happy, you know, and, and you want to promote what they're promoting and, and stuff like that. But you still have that one-on-one -on -one kind of thing. Yeah. And I think it's brilliant how you, like, okay, I'm going to interview these people to get to them and get to the hierarchy. Did you already know that that was the, the pathway of the method of the madness to, to go? No. <laughs> no, I was just, <laughs> it was like a, like a, a dream, you know, like a pipe dream. But I figured he doesn't really love press. And I knew that, I knew that about him. And I figured uh, the more pe the more established I got, the more people I interviewed, the better chance I had. But I, di I didn't know it for sure. I didn't. Yeah. And then when I finally got the interview, I was nervous. <laughs> are you ever, are you ever, Mark, are you ever really nervous when you interview someone? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it, you know, it's a, kind of a cool feeling. It's kind of like going on stage in front of a million people, but it's, you know, but different. No, and like you said, it's like an intimate setting. So it's just you and the, the person you're interviewing. So it's like, oh, I gotta, I gotta be cool. Like, <laughs> I don't yeah. wanna make it work because then they'll feel uncomfortable. Um, so how was it? So it was just basically the build up of your portfolio that way when you talk to his PR team, like, oh, okay, okay, she's interviewed this to that person or pretty much, pretty much. I had a, by the time I interviewed him, I had a huge resume. I mean, I, I Diana Ross was like big, she was big time. And to yeah. get the, her, that was like, oh my God, big. And, um, I had Brooke Shields, she, you know, she's pretty big. I had, um, oh my, so many people. I had Spandau Ballet, who was pretty big. Ballet, okay, okay. I know this much is true, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, and that was a big deal to me too. And it, every step I got, everyone I interviewed, I thought, in my mind, brought me one step closer to Adam, mm -hmm. to uh, interviewing him. And it was worth it, it was so worth the interview, he's great. He's, you know, he was great. He stayed on the phone. I was told that if he liked the interview, he would, I had 30 minutes, which is long for an interview, especially a written interview. So I had yeah. 30 minutes, which I was, I said, all right. If, and I was told if he likes your questions, he won't cut you off. But if he doesn't, he's going to cut you off early. Yeah. And then I was told if he really likes your questions, he'll talk longer. And he wound up talking for almost an hour. So that was cool. Matter of fact, I cut him off because I, I had no more questions. I didn't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And um, so in your, your vast history of being a, a celebrity journalist, what would you say has been like the most challenging aspect of your career? You know what? I, I can't really say I had many challenges. I, I always kind of got to interview whom I wanted to. I never had, um, I had a couple of scheduling issues, but I, I don't, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say I ever had a challenge. Well, okay, here's a challenge, writing them up after. Every time someone talks for 20 minutes, the rule of thumb is it takes you four hours to transpose it onto Transcribing. or whatever. So, I mean, if, if that's a challenge, you know, considered a challenge, and yeah, that was a challenge. Diana Ross was a little bit of a challenge because she only had like one word answers. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but I haven't really had that many challenges, so I'm lucky. The challenge how was, uh, how yeah. was Cindy Lauper? Cindy Lauper's another one. I think of Captain Lou Albino. Uh, girls just want to have fun and just. Uh -huh. Was she like just. I just imagine I, her being with all the I energy. I interviewed her 12 times. Wow. So she kept coming back for more. She was cool. And she's a native New Yorker, so. She's... Yes, she is. 
and she goes to a lot of events in New York, and sometimes she just winds up there. So yeah, she was. She's she's always a great interview, and she's always very giving. You know, she likes she likes to be interviewed, and she's she's busy though. She's really busy. Yeah, even now, and then um, Annie Lennox, um, uh, uh, Eurythmics. I mean, me growing that up, and great. Annie Lennox. There's always there was always an air of mystery of the you know the music videos and mm-hmm. I, I bet she was a pretty interesting in, in, interviewee as well. Funny, funny story about Annie Lennox. Um, I interviewed her on the way to meeting Billy Idol in the car. But <laughs> that, they changed the time on me. So what happened was I had my friend Colin in the car and. And when it came time to interview her, we were in the city. It was noisy. It was hot because it was summer. I made him park the car. I closed all the windows. So they only gave me 10 minutes with her. But that was, believe me, that was enough. (laughs) She she was, she was um, very, she wasn't, not, not difficult. She was just, she wanted to talk about what she wanted to talk about. And she answered a couple of other questions. She was she had put out an album, and she answered a couple of other questions. But the thing was, I was in a race to get to see Billy Idol. So yeah. between interviewing her and going to see Billy Idol, it was crazy. It was just a crazy mix. But I'll you know I'll never forget that interview. She um she was very nice. They were they were all every single one of them. There was not one horrible one in the bunch. Not at all. Mm. You know most and- of the. That an interview with someone it's because they want it yeah oh they're probably going to be nice and i used to prepare questions you know i don't do that anymore i just kind of have a conversation yeah but once in a while I'll, you know if i'm really nervous if it's somebody really high profile i might prepare one or two just so i'm not nervous but i don't actually get to use them it's more psychological on my part and then your previous publication, so I take it you're a, you're a Trekkie. You like Star Trek or? I do. I do. That was my, when I was 16 years old, that was my very first interview with uh, Leonard Nimoy, Mr. Spock. Wow. I was 16. I loved Star Trek. I met a guy that owned what a store then called the Federation Trading Post. Mm-hmm. And he was already writing for something called the giant Star Trek poster book. He found out I could write, so I started writing that, and then Valentine and uh, Paramount came to me because I was a nursing student, and they said, uh, do you want to write a medical book? So I wound up writing the Star Trek Medical Reference Manual licensed by Paramount. Wow. And I was like, I don't know, 16 or 17 when I did that, so that was kind of cool. And I imagine, is is was Leonard Lemore, was he tall? He looks tall. Maybe it's just... He's tall. Tell- really tall. Really yeah. tall. And he chain smoked one cigarette after the other. Really nice stuff. I got to meet his parents. I, I was a fangirl for Leonard Nimoy, totally. And I got to meet his parents in, in Boston. And then he did a, a, a show, a Broadway play, Equus. And I got to meet him there. And then I got to meet him a whole bunch of other times because we used to do the conventions. The store, the Federation Trading Post used to go to all the conventions. And I used to do the trivia quiz. So that was kind of cool. Trekkies love trivia, love trivia quizzes. So I used to go up on the stage and, and just ask the questions, and it was fun. But yes, I was a big, big Star Trek fan. Still am. Still love Star Trek. Well, Star Trek is huge. I mean, you like it's. it's I mean, it's just like so many different iterations, and then so many stars have been like Leonard Nimoy, um, Captain Kirk, even uh, what was it? Whoopi Goldberg was in. I forget. It was like the eighties. Ah, I forget which one it was. Um, that wasn't Generations. But um, I'm not familiar wow. with that one, but probably. Yeah, that, yeah, that was like in the '80s. She was, she was, she was in one of the stars. It was like one of the the, the off spinoffs. Um, so how did you end up meeting um, Ron Russell, and Jimmy Starr, and being part of World Star PR? Well, that's a very interesting story. I had written a book called Precious Little Devils, and the same publicist that happened to be Adam Ant's publicist. I did her a lot of favors, obviously, because I wanted to interview Adam Ant. But she yeah. did me something you know, and she had me on, she knew Jimmy and Ron, she had me on this show. We became instant friends. They used to live in Pennsylvania. And the next week, 
the, the following week for the week that I was on the show, they actually came, to, they came here, they came to Fire Island with us and we became huge friends right away and stayed friends. And then Jimmy and I, Jimmy had a show and I was writing and neither one of us were getting paid for what we do because writers don't make money in the, and neither do podcast people unless they have lots of sponsors, which they don't. Yeah, and, yeah. And I'm sure you know. <laughs> we decided since we had more connections than anybody that we would just try and open a PR company. So we did. And it was like super successful. We, were, we surprised ourselves. But the thing is, I'm a journalist. So there's never a time when our clients aren't written about or, and, and Jimmy can write too. He's a great writer as well. So he does all the press releases and has people on his show. And we have lots of radio shows and people like you who are kind enough to interview our clients. Yeah. And so pretty much, pretty, I love it. We love it. Jimmy and I, matter of fact, I think Jimmy and I single-handedly um, made this virus because we used to say, if someone would lock us in the house for 48 hours and tell us all we had to do was work, we would be so happy. So I think like mentally we created this virus. <laughs> but in any case... That's how I met them, and you know, of course, we stayed friends. And then they moved out to um, Palm Springs, and I just, I go out to Palm. Well, I did go out to Palm Springs in L.A. pretty yeah. often. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I feel bad because it's Ron's. I'm going to say it. It's Ron's 80th birthday on May 28th. Oh, so it's coming up. Yeah. It's coming up. So if you remember, Ron, happy birthday. <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. Ron must have found the fountain to use because that's what I never thought he looks great, right? No yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I, I like I like your guys, the energy that you like I said, the energy you guys have, the network, um, just great energy and great people to be around. And and I, I like to say it's like meeting you, Jimmy and Ron, it's one of those moments, you know, in your life. It's one of those 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 defining life moments, right? And um we had this wonderful time at the Oscar Gala, and then, <laughs> but and, and it's something both of us will always remember, and because of it, we'll probably always be friends, which is a yeah. really cool. Like, how many times does that happen in life? Yeah, yeah. You were, you were a great interviewer. You were great, I and mean, people really loved you. I have to say that Su Wang, even Su Wang, loved you. Oh, that's that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so. What advice would you say? Could you, we hit on some key points as far as writing and your story kind of reminds me of uh, that movie, Almost Famous, you know, A lot except, of people say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. like what advice would you give somebody that looks at Eileen and follows her rock star journey and wants to become a journalist and, and be in, and do PR? Like what advice would you give them going into this uh, industry? Really simple. Writing is is not a talent. It's a learned thing. The more you write, the more you practice, the better you get. You don't have to be, you don't have to even know how to spell. I don't know how to spell. All you have to do is, is want to do it. People can do pretty much anything they want to do if they have that mindset. You know, I always tell people, just do it. Try it. See if you like it. And writing, like I said, it's, it's learned. It's a learned art. Some people say, oh my God, you're such a good writer. Well, I probably wasn't always, <laughs> you know? I just, the more you write, the better you get. You learn more words, you learn more styles, and uh, it just gets to be more fun and it gets easier and easier. Just like a singer, you know, needs to learn how to sing or, or you know, someone that plays an instrument has to practice and practice. That's what writing is, practice and practice. Yeah. Very important that to have like um, the the coverage of so we were actually at the Su Wong event and then actually afterwards the write up that you and the, the team did I was like wow it was it was perfect it was a magical moment right I was like I perfectly well we thought you were great and Gary and um, you guys were like right on you were right there and everyone yeah. you had a, you had a huge line huge. Yeah. <laughs> you, 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 you pop it last an hour or two. You guys yeah. were there for the entire time. 
And I, I think Su Wang even came out after the event was over and for an interview and the red carpet was still there and he was still there. Nobody yeah. is that dedicated. So that was great. Thank you for that. It was funny. It was funny because we were there and um, I was like, I need to get a drink. And so I went to the bathroom, got a drink, went to the bathroom, came back. <laughs> It was just those line, like line of people, and then even now, like um, Mike Ferguson, I'm, we're still in contact with a lot of those people, and um, yeah, Gary did a phenomenal job because I mean it was our first time doing this, and I'm like, all right, we gotta get the interviews on point, and then Gary, coming from a film background, was like, look, we gotta make this look, you know, all this come together, and he did he a phenomenal. Did a phenomenal. I didn't know it was your first time though. That's pretty good for a first time. <laughs> <laughs> Really good for a first time. Red carpets aren't easy. They're not because you're crowded. You don't have much time. It's noisy, and you have to know and you have to know what the person does and, and and think about what to ask them. And that's not easy. And you can't ask them all the same questions. So you have to really think on your feet. And I oh, yeah. think totally. It was beautiful. Amazing. It's so much going on, you're like, <laughs> it's like bam, 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 bam. When this is over, any red carpet that I'm involved in, I am going to bring you along. Oh, I, I'll be more than happy, more than happy, yeah. Uh, wow, so Eileen, thank you for um, for coming out and being on Deeper Than Music. What are you doing? It's great. What are you doing to stay sane? Cause like, you're in New York. New York is like, it's New York, California, and I just know, like, I have friends in New York, and I just pray for them every day because I know, out of this whole pandemic, New York is like. Wait, wait, wait. Um, what do I do to stay sane? You're assuming that I am sane. <laughs> 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 um, people in New York, I don't know. You know, I'm not in the city. Mm -hmm. I live in a Long Island suburb. Even that we were hit, we have like fifty thousand ourselves. So. I, you know what? I'm, I'm working. I'm busier than ever. You have to yeah. feel that too because the only thing can read. Yeah, yeah. And my clients, you know, are depending on me to keep them relevant. So I'm busy, really busy. Busy. Like every minute. Like sometimes till three in the morning. So, uh, like I said, I'm, I, I was never sane to begin with. So I'm not going <laughs> to stop. <laughs> yeah. I like how you like I owned a bar I went from that to like okay right and you like hey why don't you let me let me interview and do the write-ups that's pretty awesome and I'm pretty sure owning a bar you saw a lot of stuff <laughs> but, it was kind of cool because it was a gay bar and yeah. I, owned it, I owned it with my partner Colin who lives with me and <laughs> I, I was always for some reason accepted in the gay community even though I wasn't gay but I was always accepted, I don't know, I was like a gay magnet wherever I went. And that's, to me, that's like the most fun community there is anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, I own the bar and, and yeah, I saw things you wouldn't believe. <laughs> you wouldn't believe and I, I don't think I would tell. <laughs> but, but what happened in the bar stays in the bar, one of those kind of things. Yeah. No, no, I, you have like this energy, like you, Jimmy, you all like, it's like the Wonder Twins. You guys have this magnetic energy. Like I remember, we didn't, we never met before. Like, I mean, in person. And then the minute I walk, bam, Eileen. And then uh, later on, Ron and Jimmy come in. It's like, man, like the energy and everybody is like, the, the, the molecules in the room change and everybody would gravitate to you all. So it, it's awesome and it makes sense. Like I could see, I could see why, you know, people gravitate to you they they do they do but you know what because i'm a people person ron is certainly a people person and jimmy is too so what happens is when you when you have that kind of vibe you like bring forth that vibe to yourself so it's not really a secret it just is it just yeah. is people see you're happy and having fun and they want to be happy and having fun so we smile, they smile. Simple. Yeah, that's true. And so when you actually got to meet and have the interview with Adam, um, what was the highlight of that that interview? Remember uh, I actually got to meet Adam before I like I said before I had the interview. I did the interview over the phone. Oh yeah. So 
I remember like a half an hour, you know, I was watching the clock, watching the clock. I, w- I had like six microphones prepared. <laughs> and um, just in case one went wrong. Yeah. I, I had his phone number. They gave me his phone number. So I, just the fact that I had his own phone number, I was just like, oh my God. And, and it, I was here and he was in England. So sometimes the phones don't exactly work. So I was a little nervous about that too. Um, but once he was nervous too, that's, that's the cool thing. He was wow. totally nervous. He was stuttering and everything. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> he kept like changing his answers and he was like a big fan of Marvin Gaye. And he was on, um, 25 years of Motown. He was on that television show. Right. With when Michael Jackson did the moonwalk. Yes. Correct. He was wearing like, um, it was kind of like, I don't kind of like Prince and the Revolutionary is. Yes. And he did um, um, Diana Ross's, okay, I remember that. I remember that. Uh-huh. Tainted Love he did. And Diana yeah, Ross yeah. came on and danced while he was on and he didn't know. And he said, all well, he heard like the audience go crazy. And he was on after Michael Jackson, so he was nervous about that. And, um, <laughs> hold on. And he, um, he was nervous about that, and then he turned around, and there was Diana Ross, and he, you know, he went to dance with her or whatever it was. But I, I was nervous. I was very nervous. And he, um, he, he was looked just as nervous. He was just as nervous. He was, he was answering the questions, but he kept changing them. And then when I was finished, he said, "Oh, this is a very telling interview. I really had a good time." And he said, and later I'll be able to think of, you know, I, I know I'll be able to think of the answer, better answers. And then I said, you know, he's teasing. I said, well, you could just call me back. And then he started answering the questions again. The same question. <laughs> one was about Marvin Gaye. And he loved him. That was his hero. And he, he told me a story about Marvin Gaye, how uh, Marvin Gaye knocked on his door to introduce himself. And he said he remembered he was wearing a white suit and a white tie. And he knocked on the door and he introduced, you know, he said, hello, this is Marvin Gaye. I'm Marvin Gaye. And, and Adam looked, just, he said, he just looked at him and said, I know who you are. So like, even these big celebrities become fangirls <laughs> yeah. or fanboys, which is really kind of cool. So I was nervous, but after speaking to him for about 10 minutes, I like calmed down. And by the end we were laughing and joking and and then when I met him again, I actually met him again in his dressing room that same year. Maybe a few. Yeah, that same year. A couple of months later, I met him in his dressing room. And um, we were doing like a, another part of an interview. And I, I did all his um, reviews for the shows. So I met him in his, and, and he actually kissed me right here on my lips, right here. Um, <laughs> and, and that was like, like I was like a regular person, you know, like I was like, and uh, his PR person, I, I couldn't even remember what he said to me. And I said, what did Adam say? What did, and she said, I didn't hear him because I was watching him making out. I was watching you making out with my client. So that, you know, that was all kind of cool. Too. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And then there's another person you, you actually got to meet. And I, I think they had, I used to love behind the music. And I think that group had one of the best um interviews uh because of the tension within the band and i just remember being a, a, a child of the 80s and i was a huge fan of boy george and the culture club oh how was God. boy george boy george was a, another strange kind of thing um, he, was, <laughs> <laughs> he did a concert in forest hills stadium uh-huh. which is a big huge stadium and he was doing it with um the b-52s okay and- and the Thompson Twins. Oh wow! The I had introduced I had interviewed the Thompson Twins and my photographer, that Billy, that I think you met too. Um, he went to Su Wang's gala with his husband, and we went to the stadium. And he had backstage passes from Fred because he was friends with them. And I had backstage passes from from Tom Bailey. So together we got to go backstage and. See, you know, we kind of met Boy George, but he went into his dressing room, and then we met his his um, manager and, and manager PK, 
And PK said, I'll tell you what, I will get you an interview with Boy George if you write the best review that you ever wrote in your whole entire life. So I went home and I wrote the best review that I ever wrote in my whole entire life. And he called me the next day and he goes, all right, now you're Boy George's favorite journalist. So I got to interview him, but I also got to write the bio for his first album in 19 years. So that was like a big honor. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And he, he was very, he's very brilliant, very brilliant, very kind, um, very funny and very talkative. <laughs> Very, we were on the phone for over an hour. Yeah, because I remember behind the music, the tension between, the love affair between him and the drummer. And uh, I always thought they were ahead of their time in the 80s. And the, just totally. the music. Totally, totally, totally. And, and the drummer was cool too. Uh, the drummer and the bass player, he was very, but the drummer was really not really nice, really nice guy. And, he remembered Billy from something, and I, I don't even want to know where he remembered Billy from, and neither does Billy. <laughs> <laughs> Fire from some wild party. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. And then, uh, then I became friends through Billy with Fred from B-52s, and he's amazing. He's an amazing person. Great interview. A lot of fun. My, yeah, I have the best clients in the world. I have Scott Page from Pink Floyd, Mickey Burns from Profiles, Sherry, uh, Sherry Nelson, who you met, she's a beautiful model, and the FMs and Revolution, and oh my God, I better think of Wendy. I better think of all of them now that I started. Wendy, and uh, we actually rep a, a, they're brilliant. They're just brilliant. They're called Chatter 365, and they have this new COVID virus. They, they write apps. Who writes apps? Okay, okay, okay. And then I, my newest one is Howard Bloom. He was the biggest publicist in life. He um, interview, uh, interviewed, he um, represented Michael Jackson and Prince and Bette Midler and almost anyone that you can think of. <laughs> Alex yeah, like yeah. So, and he hired us, so I was like really honored by that. I thought that was really cool. And I have great clients and I have a great life, except for this virus. But <laughs> my next question was like, so when we get back to normalcy, what can we expect from Eileen Shapiro, World Star PR? Like, what are the, when things lots start? And lots, lots and lots of red carpets and Soho Johnny and Scott Page are doing this huge project that is going to happen the night be the night before Thanksgiving. And my two favorite clients in life. They did not say that either, but they know it. And um, so you, you can actually expect the you could you could expect to go to many, many, many more red carpets. With <laughs> <laughs> and um, Hopefully all our clients, you know, get out there because a lot of them are musicians and I hope oh, they yeah. all get out there and, and continue with their creativity. A lot of them are, are doing very creative things right now. I have a, the, a, the band Revolution with um, the drummer is the drummer, Dave Kendrick from, from Devo and uh, the front man, no, we call him No, has played with everyone from Aretha Franklin to... No doubt. And they're all getting super, super creative. They're, they're doing things that they never would have done if they weren't like locked up and forced to do it. So that's kind of cool too. So I think people are going to see a lot of creativity, yeah. a lot of different ways to see shows. And I think people are also, because of this, getting more human. They're actually like nice to each other. They wave to each other, hi, you know, from a distance, but they're still doing that. They're still waving and saying hello. So I think a lot of, you know, it isn't all bad. I, I think a lot of cool things will happen because of this. Yeah, and I think like um, I always say, like there's going to be some great albums that come out come out of this because people now have time to create and then and innovate and just uh, I mean, you have time, right? You we have time. We're we're here. <laughs> so, I'm elastic now. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm elastic. Yeah. But. 
Eileen, thank you for coming out. And um, where can people find you on social media, World Star PR? It's self promotion time. All right. So on Instagram, I'm Eileen Shapiro3. Same on Twitter and on Facebook. Just look for Eileen Shapiro and you'll find me. And uh, I have a website with all my interviews, which is Eileen Shapiro dot rocks, I think. <laughs> Rocks for rock star. <laughs> and if you want to know World Star PRs, uh, you got to ask Jimmy because I have no clue. <laughs> I'll, I'll post it on, on this interview. Uh, there you go. <laughs> well, thank you so much. You, you're great as always. Energetic and fun and great. My favorite interviewer in life. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm honored. So ladies and gentlemen, here you have it. Another great interview with Eileen Shapiro here on Deeper Than Music. Thank <laughs> you.